Things are looking grim for any defenders who like to stay undetected as Operation Brutal Swarm brings a new intel gathering operator to the attack. His name is Grim, and his Kawan Hive Launcher gadget can reveal enemy positions from a safe distance with bees. Micro air vehicles, technically, but once you're in the swarm and getting pinged repeatedly, you'll have bigger problems to deal with. Operation Brutal Swarm is also introducing the stadium map into the competitive pool, as well as updating the recoil system and making weapon attachments more impactful. Plus, a new impact EMP grenade arrives to give more attackers the power to turn out the lights. All this and more is coming with Operation Brutal Swarm, and your deeper look at it all continues now. So in Brutal Swarm, this is our season of balance. We're taking a good hard look at our weapon, weapon handling, and recoil systems, which are scary topics to talk about, but they're very important for our game. One of the biggest changes we're making is separating the balancing between the PC world and the console world. Console will now be tuned separately than any other changes that we're doing on PC right now. And that's to make sure that we have player comfort in mind for all of the changes that we do want to make for console. That means all of the other changes we're talking about today only affect PC. We're making some changes to the recoil system. What we're looking at with vertical recoil is a stepping ladder of phases for these weapons. For ARs and SMGs, you'll see there's three phases, and at each phase, you will get an increase in recoil. For LMGs, this is even stronger, especially for LMGs on high-capacity magazine weapons. Here, with the horizontal recoil, you can see that the changes aren't as drastic. However, it goes by the same philosophy. The longer that you hold down the trigger, the more horizontal sway that you'll get with any AR, SMG, and LMG. We are now making sure that burst fire is the favored way to approach any kind of one-on-one -on -one interaction. We looked at sustained fire, and it has a lot of randomness that doesn't answer to what the core of Siege is, which is tactical gunplay. So the big differences here is the longer you pull down the trigger, the more you'll have in recoil. We always want to encourage strategy, holding the correct angle, and crosshair placement over holding down the trigger and spraying and praying. And that's why these changes are focusing on burst fire, making sure that you make a decisive shot and you hit it so that we don't reward luck as much as we reward skill in the game. Another reason why this is a big change for us is the idea of bringing customization and the tools to players to make the decisions they want to make when it comes to their loadout. We're really opening up customization and attachments this season because of these changes. If you want to deal with recoil, we give you new options. Muzzle brake and flash hiders are coming to all of these weapon families. We're also bringing more grips, angled and vertical, and more scopes than ever before. That means that you can build your loadout the way that you want to play, and it means that you're not stuck with a metal weapon. The other thing we're looking at too is making sure that every piece of customization is meaningful, that you actually have real choice between them all. Silencers now will be available without the damage debuff, making it that much more interesting to play with. With all of these new changes, we have a new ecosystem of weapons for players to play with. You can figure out what works for you, and it gives new freedom to how you want to play the game, and it also focuses on the tactical gameplay that we have in Siege. One of the positive impacts that are going to come out of this is new weapons that have 
long been determined, not part of the meta or forgotten or nerfed to the point where they aren't used anymore, could get a second life. Feedback is always really important for us in Siege, especially when it's something as important as recoil. We organize a creator's workshop, bringing people in to experience the gameplay changes, to get their feedback. We had Q&A sessions, and we won't stop there. It's really important for us that we grow on this and that we check to maintain the health of the meta of the game, and we get all of your feedback as well. These are subtle changes that are changing the way that we can introduce new attachments and new ways to play the game. And we really do believe that this reinforces what Siege is all about. As we introduced in the GR7 season reveal, we were working on the EMP Impact Grenade. So that's alternative to Thatcher, that it's the only one that can use the EMP Grenade. So that's a little bit what we already do in the game with Maverick, Ivana or Termite. And we added the Heartbreed secondary gadget. This new EMP impact grenade will have a range of 2 meters instead of 5 meters of the Thatcher's one. Also, gadgets and electricity will be disabled during 9 seconds instead of 15. It will work as an impact, so it detonates on impact. Thatcher, for sure, will continue being the main operator to disable electricity. The operators that will have the EMP impact as the third option are Sledge, Montaigne, Blackbird, Dokaebi, Lion, Gridlock, Knock, Osa, and the Recruit, and will be equipped with two gadget units. We hope that this change will have a positive impact on our players, because they will work on more situations to win the match, and also they will be able to play Thatcher with his cool loadout. We know that you had a little preview of this feature during the last test server, so we are going to introduce it right now. If the operator falls into DBNO while wearing an armor plate from Rook, they will be able to use the Wistan ability. Once the Wistan animation is finished, the operator will revive with 20 health points. The objective is to give more value to the Rook's armor plate, which can help us a lot if we fall into DBNO during the round. The Dokaebi logic bomb was not affecting the operators on the support mode, so from now, the dead operators will be affected as the life ones, but the logic bomb cannot be interrupted. With this change, we will be giving more importance to Okaebi's ability and will be more consistent. The Kawan Eye Launcher is Grim's gadget. It's a over-the-shoulder bazooka kind of launcher. You equip it similar to what you would do with Ash or Zofia. It shoots a projectile that will travel in a straight line. It will stick to the surface it's shot at. Once it sticks to the surface, it will release a canister. If it's on the floor, it will just open. The effect will take place there. If it's stuck on the uh, on the wall, it will propel propel it down on the floor. So the effect will be generated from this canister. The effect itself is a, a swarm of bots, really a cloud of robotic bees. They reveal any defenders that would be inside the swarm. They will be tracked in live action, so the, the red mark will follow them as they move around. And last part is the decay and the debuff that you will have once you leave the, the swarm. This is the small beast that sticks to you as you leave. You will get pinged three times in a short period of time, similar to the alibi decoy that we have in, in the game already. We're really happy to tell you that Grim is a three speed, one health attacker. It's been a while since we had one of those, and it really goes with the rest of the loadout. We have the 5.52 Commando as a primary assault rifle. Uh, you know how, it, how reliable, how good it is. But we also have the shotgun, the SG CQB, as a, another primary option. It's one of the first times that we have an operator that uses a shotgun and is a tree speed. If you remember, you remember, but for this time, it's the, the first named operator that we have. In the secondary weapon, we have the P229. For the secondary gadgets, we have the breach charge. It, well, it adds a layer of verticality to Grim. You can place the breach charge on the floor, shoot the gadget through the bars. So you're now funneling the, the defenders from the top floor. So it really adds another layer to this gadget. Or you can go with the claymore. It's a really a natural progression with this gadget. You shoot it in the doorway. There's no one in there because you don't have any marks or there's no one, you're, you don't hear anyone. You can go place a claymore now. Like you secured something. So it's really like a natural pro progression of the gadget. Crim's role is part entry. You want him inside the building first. You have a really good gadget to hunt down roamers. You have the three speeds, so you're as quick as them. You have the good weapon to go to, to pick those fights. And you have the ability to funnel them inside some rooms with your gadget. You shoot this in a doorway, the defenders cannot go in there. Like, you know they won't cross this door. And if they do, everyone on the team will be alerted. 
We want to have a, an attacker that is about aggression. We've had operators that were planning heavy, you had to think about what you were doing, but Grimms is a bit more on the instinct. You have this launcher that denies some area, you have the assault rifle to take areas, so it's really you're bringing the fight to them. Grimms gadget always succeeds. So if you hit, um, hit someone, you will have the red mark. Everyone on the team will know that there's something going on. If there's nothing, there's no red mark, well, everyone will know that there's no one in there. So you always succeed with this gadget. Operators like Nomad, Gridlock, they really help you secure the areas that you can attack with the Grim. If you know that there's a defender stuck inside a room and contesting this with Grim would be difficult, you can ask Sense or have a smoke grenade to block the line of sight so you can have the launcher get in there. When you know the, op the, the opposing team has a lot of roamers, caveras, bandits, vigil, you can ask the help from, from Jekyll. He can track them down with, his foot, uh, with their footsteps. So if they move, they leave footsteps. If they move, they might get into, caught inside Grim, uh, Grim Swarms. So it's really a tag team to get, uh, get around the roamers. Also, you have Lion. Lion really creates this move or don't move. You have this swarm that is creating on you, but Lion is going off. Do I move? Do I not move? Like, it creates interesting situations when you have those operators against the defending team. Mute is one of the greatest counter that we have to Grim. For Mute, if the canister is stuck inside the, the Mute Jammer's radius, it won't release the swarm at all. So you will have to take care of the Mute Jammer first before having the effect. If you are standing in the radius of a Mute Jammer and there's a swarm around you, you won't be revealed. If you're affected by the debuff or the DK and you run inside the radius of a new jammer, you will be cleansed. You can think of it similar to the call from Doki Doki. The projectile can be caught by Womai, Aruni, or Jaeger's gadget. Obviously, Womai is the most fun one because it will displace the effect, but the other one will get rid of the canister altogether. If the canister hits electricity, be it in a barbed wire or on a, on a wall, it will get destroyed. The way we designed Grimm's uh, gadget, we made sure that there's a lot of specific timings. You can hear the shot. You will hear it stick. You will hear the canister opening, and then there will be the swarm. So there's a lot of timings that you will learn as you play against Grimm, and each one of those is a warning that something is happening. So you have, as a player, the choice of running or fighting. Grimm is a really aggressive attacker. We have the tree speed, we have the good assault rifle, we have all of the tools to give you an attacker that is really in the face of defenders. So really an aggressive attacker. At the launch of the last season, Operation Vector Glare, we let you know that the new map originally planned for this season would be delayed to next season. In the meantime, we've got a little surprise for you. The stadium map from the Road to SI event is entering the map pool. Don't ban it. Don't do it. Don't ban it. More on that later. Game designer Josem L. Rene is here to share the good news and the details. Originally for season three, we planned to bring you the Singapore map, but we needed some more time to tweak and uh, finish our Polish path. So instead, we will be bringing you something else, the stadium map. So the stadium maps are usually only available during the Road to SI event, but it was kind of a, a missed opportunity to have, a, the, to have them only available a couple of weeks while they are full-blown maps. So while internally we always had a lot of fun playing it, uh, we needed a, a little bit of outside feedback to be sure that it was ready to be brought to the, uh, the rank pool. Uh, so we asked a couple of pros to workshop and talk with us, and they had a, lo a lot of positive feedback about the map. That's pretty much it. We did a couple of tweaks here and there. We brought up the lighting so it's uh, less dark, uh, distributed the spawns so they're equally uh, distributed. And finally, we added the game modes, uh, the team deathmatch and the PvE elements. We are very excited to bring you this map uh, as a uh, ranked map or even a casual it will be available on all players, mainly because it is a familiar yet different feeling, because it's a two maps that are merged together, something that our player know, but also there are some flavorful elements like the uh, bulletproof glass, the, uh, the fact that they are merged together. Um, so it will bring a lot of uh, exciting gameplay from our players. 
It's always fun to spawn from the gantry, going down toward the, the map itself. It's a safe and a secure spawn that allows you to enter from unconventional ways. So right now, the way the tactical map works is that it will show the spawn and objective locations. But it's true that it forces players to remember a lot of information. And even if the attackers find the objective, it will not be shown in the tactical map. We're doing a couple of quality of life changes to display the location of the objective once the attackers find it during the preparation phase. The attackers will also be able to see a list of potential objectives by the defense and also an icon next to the locked objectives. This will help players with their map knowledge and it will also show previously hidden information that maybe more experienced players already knew. But overall, it will help players focus on decisions that matter, like planning their attack instead of feeling lost around the tactical map. We have been monitoring the map ban and pick rate, as well as the community sentiment regarding map distribution. If we take a look at the data right now, we can see how we have 3 to 4 maps with over 10% of the play rate, as well as maps below the 4% mark. We understand that map ban has room for improvements, and we want to address some of these concerns with these season changes. We're changing the map ban phase to contain 5 maps instead of 3. That way, if both teams decide to ban one map, the final decision will be a random between the 3 remaining maps. As well as, if both teams decide to ban the same map, the final decision will be between the four remaining maps. In the same case, if both teams decide not to ban any map, the final decision will be a random between the five remaining maps. With this change, we aim at increasing map diversity while also maintaining the player agency of being able to ban maps from the pool. We will continue to monitor the situation and the performance of this change, but also make any adjustments necessary as part of our commitment on increasing map diversity. We know that this will help with map representation, but we also have future plans to tackle the exact problem of new maps being banned. Last season, we introduced reputation penalties, by adding penalties toward the friendly fire. With the new season, we will be adding a new penalty for abusive tech chat. So the people that are abusing the tech chat by sending hateful and abusive content will be detected, they will be reported by users, and repeated offenders will be under this new penalty. When the sanction will be triggered on the player, the penalty will occur on several matches. So the person that will be under this penalty will still be able to send text messages. However, only the people that choose to unmute him will be able to see those messages. It's really key that we give player choice to unmute somebody that is under this sanction. When the system will be released, there will be a grace period. During this grace period, only warnings will be triggered, no sanction. After this grace period, repeated offender will be under this penalty. The goal will be to remove and reduce the amount of hateful and abusive content that you are receiving through the tech chat. We want to create a positive environment for everybody. It is key. Communication in your game is key, and we want to provide a safer environment. Match replay is a great addition to the game. It allows you to rewatch your match and improve your strategy. However, we heard you. Your voice is really important. So that's why with season three, we will be including reporting options. We totally understand that during a live match, you are not sometimes able to report a player. Sometimes the player disconnected. So there is many scenarios. By adding those options to the match replay, you will be able to take the time to review the whole gameplay and report this person. Reporting is really important and key for us. While receiving the reporting, we will be able to investigate and take actions. This will greatly help us to improve our system, but also to better act on those cheaters and distribute the right sanction at the right moment. Your voice is really important, it is key for us, so please continue and use those reporting tools. This new addition to the game will be available on all platforms, PC and console for everybody. The team put a lot of effort 
toward all of this new feature. For the future, I'm really excited about what we will be building, reputation system and commendation system. I hope you will enjoy all content. We're truly excited to bring back one of the perks that was in the year past prior. So we're bringing back the shop discount. So what this means is for the battle pass owners, you'll be able to have the 10% shop discount during the season where you have the battle pass. And for our year pass owners, you will have it up until the end of year seven. This 10% discount will apply on any items on the shop, whether it's on access credit or renown. So this means alpha packs, collection packs, elites, or esports items, all of this will be at a 10% reduction. We know that Siege is a game that is best played with your friends. So we want you to be able to also experience the battle pass with one of your friends. So during season two, we soft launched the buy for a friend feature for the battle pass. We're more confident in the system now. So in season three, we're deploying it everywhere. So what this means is that for you as a player, you will be able to purchase the battle pass for one of your friends. For, for the moment, buying the battle pass for one of your friends and gifting it is actually going to be only for the same platform as you. But looking in the future, once we'll be cross platform and cross progression, this is something that we'll be looking at. The only condition that you have for buying a battle pass is that you have to be friends with a person for more than 90 days for now. So the buying for a friend is a feature that we'll be looking into expanding to other type of categories in the future. So maybe we'll look into esports items, elites, uh, but for now we'll gather your feedback on how it performs uh, around the battle pass.